Welcome everybody. I'm delighted to have you with us for our webinar on data science, enabling finance transformation to evolve. So our primary topic for today is the application of data science to finance transformation and the finance organization in general. Let me introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Lockridge. I am the principal consultant at Lockridge Transformations and I'm a finance professional by background. I uh, specialize in finance transformation and continuous improvement. And that's been the passion in recent years of my career. Lockridge Transformations is a boutique consulting firm. We specialize in delivering functional improvements and transformation, positively impacting the bottom line and organizational culture. We're based between the UK and the Netherlands, but we work with clients globally. So we're thrilled today to have a guest speaker join us. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Tushar Bellapurkar. Welcome, Tushar. So we've known each other for some years, as it happens, and uh, we first got to know each other when Tushar had a crucial role in one of the global programmes within my portfolio in my last corporate role. Tushar, I initially knew you as a Lean Six Sigma expert. As a master black belt, you supported trainee black belts in my team, while also having a critical role in deploying continuous improvement in one of the global business units and driving change across the organization. But tell me, what have you been up to in the meantime? Hmm. So, to start with, uh, let me greet uh, the audience and, and you, Jennifer. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Trust you and your families are safe in the current challenging times of pandemic and uh, the recent mishappening in Ukraine. Um, and may rest of the 2022 20 be much healthier and safer year for all of us. So yeah, thanks Jennifer for inviting me in this forum. Now coming to your question is what I've been doing since we meet last time. Um, well, you, you took me back in history, almost seven, eight years back in time. And yes, a lot has changed uh, since then. I got more involved in Agile and then specifically in, in digital transformation and then laterally the application of uh, data science. Um, as you said, we share similar profiles in a way. So, uh, so the best part of our roles is that we need to keep abreast of uh, uh, of, of market and, and then what's the trend. And then, you know, uh, you and me, we both know that the market is moving towards a low cost automation uh, and data science. Um, I've been more closely working with uh, automation teams and experience a complete deployment of uh, uh, deployment cycle of smart automation. Uh, I mean to say robotics process automation. Um, data science is equally interesting uh, and hence I finished my master's in data science and acquired hands on experience. Um, and, and honestly, this learning is really interesting. Now that I've got two more arrows in my quiver um, for transformation. I can use data science and RPS potential solutions to deliver value to my stakeholders. So that's a bit of snippet of my journey since then. Great, thank you, Tushar. So before we continue with our dialogue, we'd actually like to know what kind of things are on all of your minds. So using the Q&A tool, please do go ahead and give us some questions or topics that are on your mind that you'd like us to reflect on today during the conversation. So I'm just going to take a moment to see if anything's coming in there. There may be a little bit delay uh, due to the tool, so I will uh, keep my eye on that as we move ahead. So while we're waiting for some input, uh, just to set the scene somewhat, uh, let's have a look at the top right of this slide. Um, which is Lockridge Transformation's view of the remit of the CFO. And today we are going to be zooming in to the digitized box. So there are two primary elements in this digitized box, and that's automation and data. So our focus in this webinar, as the title suggests, is data and automation. We've shown a, a diagram at the bottom right of the slide. That's the other part of the box. And we've planned a webinar on that for later this year. Sometimes automation and data are a bit intertwined and, and the scope can get a bit confused. We'll explore that a little bit more today. On the left of the slide, you'll see that Gartner has declared 2022 as a make or break year in this space. So if you aren't already making plans to develop your organization's processes, data 
tools and skills in this arena, it's probably time to start doing so. So with that, let's now dive into our conversation with Tushar. Let's hear some thoughts on how to unlock the value that Gartner is talking about in this space. OK, I see we have uh, some comments and, and uh, topics coming in, so let me publish that. And so that should be available for everybody to see. And as as any other topics come in as we're talking, we'll we'll put them up too. All right, Tushar, as a subject of this webinar, I can imagine that many of the participants here today are interested in that million dollar question. How can you apply data science to finance transformation and to the finance organization more widely? Hmm. So, sure. yeah, so uh, Jennifer, before asking, uh, or rather before answering your question, I must take a step back. Um, when we use data science, we simply call it financial data science, uh, which uses a lot of statistical methods to understand the problems of finance. Uh, it combines the tradition of econometrics with the technological components of, uh, of, of data science. Machine learning, predictive and prescriptive analytics can provide robust possibility for better understanding uh, of financial data and, and then solving the related problems. I feel it's one of the challenging areas for a data scientist because you need to be just more than good in two different domains. I mean, the data science and, and, and finance. Um, I mean to say that having a domain knowledge of these two streams is not only the requirements, but doing a financial data science needs to have a very good understanding of array of topics. Um, and then to name few is, is mark, financial markets, risk analytics, uh, quantitative methods, linear regression, hypothesis testing, uh, volatility estimation, uh, time series analysis, simulation methods, valuation, data wrangling, machine learning models, the famous one, <laughs> deep learning models, and then programming languages like Python, SQL, R. So the list can 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 be even more extensive uh, depending upon how complex an analysis is involved in solving the financial problem. And don't get scared, Jennifer, but that's the reality. Now let's come to your original question on how data science gets applied in finance um, or so to say finance transformation. Um, again, the list is quite long. Data science can be used within finance in several ways. Um, some of the real life examples include fraud prevention, risk management, uh, credit allocation, customer analytics, algorithmic trading, and, and, and many more. Um, now, when data science is applied to finance, the combination really helps uh, building systems and processes as well, um, as well as required skills and behaviors that extract insights from financial data uh, in various forms. It's a proven fact that data science has significantly improved risk analysis and, and anomaly detection, um, leading to notable improvements in detecting fraudulent transactions and, and money laundering uh, activities. Now, these days, algorithmic trading is, is really picking up very well and has transformed the whole trading industry. The old days of contracting an agent, you know, or, or a broker for trading and uh, is, is actually slowly becoming a history. Now today, those trading activities can be done by a machine learning model, uh, which can actually predict the uh, indices. Of course, it may not be 100% accurate all the time, but in data science, we say that more data over a period of time trains the machine learning model and, and then deliver more refined and precise results. So uh, a common myth uh, might say that fine, a robot is trading for me. Uh, however, the artificial intelligence learning model uses a, a complex, formulas combined with mathematical models and, and then human oversight to decide buy or sell financial security. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I see a direct implication or direct direct application of data science. Yeah, interesting, Tushar. Mm -hmm. Please explain a bit more on this. Yeah, so, so I, I know this feels like uh, a fairy world sometimes. Um, so, so continuing the application of data science, another famous candidate which I can think of is, is fraud detection. Um, traditional fraud detection uses rule-based models that identify usual transactions, but um, unfortunately what happens is that these models often flag legal transactions uh, based on broken rules where millions of transactions co-occur. Uh, now, by contrast, machine learning creates an algorithms that um, that process large data sets with, with, with many variables to find hidden correlations between user behavior and likelihood of the fraudulent uh, transactions. Now, let me give a real life example. I mean, I can think of that. So a few years back, I used to have a Citibank 
credit card um, and one day suddenly I, I just noticed that there are two transactions of one dollar each uh, and in a span of one minute. Uh, now the message which I received was that these transactions were attempted um, and the bank system has blocked them automatically. Now later on uh, when I called customer care I figured out that those transactions were fraud attempts uh, from some remote location in US. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and then see, see, see how the technology works. Um, uh, the system actually identified my spending pattern. It perhaps knows my current location, uh, my spending currency, uh, perhaps many more parameters, which ultimately blocked the fraud transactions. I was not a data scientist at that time, uh, and I felt that it was just by fluke. But now I understand how a machine learning model is designed and safeguards the customer's money. Um, these days banks are using data science not only for fraud detection, uh, but for credit verification, expanding their customer base, credit augmentation, on the spot loan approval, uh, and the list goes on, Jennifer. Mm. OK, and, and Tushar, you were talking a bit um, about customer analytics. How is that linked to the finance world or, or to transformation generally? Mm. Now that's an interesting one. Um, see, uh, so improved customer service is an integral part of any transformation. We both know, right? Uh, and especially in banking or insurance. Yeah. Um, in the field of customer service, forward-looking banks and fintechs serve their customers better by analyzing their transactional and behavioral data, uh, and then using various data science algorithms for sure. Now, some of the world's biggest banks are already using data science to gain insights into previous customer purchase engagements and accounts uh, that are most relevant to them. Um, these days, we all receive notices about investment products, in insurance coverage, bank uh, um, accounts, mortgages, uh, and, and many more other products that reflect our interest. Now, some people think that it is just a marketing gimmick. It is not actually um, because knowing our interest and consequently targeting the specific customer segment really help those banks and an organization to increase profitability. So that's the link between application of data science, at least in the fintech world. Now, Je Jennifer, let me pause here to take a breath, but I hope you got a flavor of data science application in finance world. Thanks, Tushar. That's been a great introduction to data science and, and some of its uses within finance. There are so many tools and techniques available and with a reasonably direct link with increased profitability, so attraction is obvious. So I know today we've got several finance colleagues on the line who are in leadership roles, and I'd like to turn now to how a finance leader might implement some of the tools and the techniques that you've talked about so far. So at Lockridge Transformations, we nearly always use our four elements of transformation model, and hopefully you see that now on the screen. And we use that model to diagnose and identify improvement opportunities as well as full scale finance transformation. And our model there, it shows the relationship between process and data, technology, organization and risk and controls. Now, I imagine that this approach is equally valid if we're thinking about how we apply data science. So I'd like for us now to explore together some of the prerequisites for creating value through the use of data science in an organization. So right at the top there, we've got processes, and that's where I'd, I'd like to start. So let us imagine that we have an organization with very low process maturity. Perhaps there's no actual process governance in place, maybe limited attention to process performance and improvement, let alone process designs in place which are there and actually used actively. So there's a lot of organizations that really are still in that category. What can they do to usefully leverage data science or is that should those organizations maybe first focus on implementing the basics? What are your thoughts, Tushar? Mm. So, uh, Jennifer, that, that's, a, that's a strategic question and it is still a puzzle for many data gurus. Mm, uh, let me respond this uh, from my own perspective. Um, and as there's no perfect recipe for creating a data science organization or a prerequisites for creating a data analytics function. 
um, we both have worked in operational excellence space um, and we know how solid sponsorship uh, pays off in a long run. Um, however, many puzzle pieces across business processes needs to be uh, implemented. Different stakeholders need to be in sync before we zeroing uh, in on a uh, data analytics strategy. Now, hence, you should not expect immediate results. Uh, let me just show a slide. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing up that slide. Uh, this really gives a nice visual glance to audience is what I'm talking. Um, so Jennifer, continuing uh, what I said earlier that creating a long term vision for analytics uh, in the organization and backing that with vision uh, with right commitment and sponsorship is, is quite crucial. Um, uh, and then simultaneously keeping the evolving organizational environment and in goals in the mind. Um, in addition, sustained investment in technology resources uh, and in training needed to ensure uh, that we have got right level of enthusiasm and then buying uh, for analytics organization to be created and then sustained. Now, so the, the simple answer to your question is that yes, if you have got well defined processes, it certainly complements the data analytics deployment. However, if the processes uh, or if the process maturity is lower, the change management effort will certainly be higher. Uh, now, this is because people may not be used to process thinking, and in my opinion, uh, data analytics is a part of process thinking. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. However, now that does not mean that organizations are going sequentially to streamline their processes and, and then they deploy data analytics. Uh, most organizations, in fact, still uses analytics in a very decentralized form, uh, scattered across regions and, and then business functions. Uh, as a result, data science might already be uh, in use, maybe in ad hoc basis or in limited pockets and, and then without a proper strategy on roadmap. Uh, look, Jennifer, I mean, each organization is unique and enhance expectations from analytics uh, should be mapped out at an early stage um, at an organization and at a project level. Now, let me link this to finance transformation. Now, suppose I mean, we have got our finance leaders as audience. Uh, assume uh, a finance leader doesn't have a relevant experience or feel comfortable making these judgment calls. So now what now in that case, it can be a great idea to uh, to bring in some external consultants such as maybe you or me uh, who have the right experience and an expertise uh, to support the return on investment estimations um, and then plan the whole investment and deployments accordingly. So let's get very practical now, right? I mean, it's critical to start small um, with, let's say, a couple of pilot, pilot projects, um, stay focused and then deliver quickly on these initiatives. Um, it's the same advice I give to all my stakeholders who wanted to build a data analytics organization or, or maybe a function. Uh, this approach really helps providing uh, wider visibility on analytics within the organization. Um, it also pro proves potential value of deploying analytics. Um, and this approach also supports any future proposals and increases the chances of stakeholder approval for more challenging and extensive use cases. It might not hurt uh, to employ successful stories from analytics or, or, or maybe analytics leaders by customizing such solutions for one's organization and provisioning for differences in scale, or organization model process, and, and then maybe industry as well. Um, now, I think a million dollar question, how do we select the pilot projects? Um, I think I'm reading your mind with this question, right, Jennifer? Yeah, too sure, bingo. I mean, this is really the dilemma for most finance leaders. You need to know which projects to start with. Yeah, so uh, Jennifer, um, honestly, there could be many good candidates for finance processes as data science can be applied to almost all finance processes. Um, still, it largely depends on nature and scale of operations. For example, uh, an FF, FMCG company can deploy data science in their offer to cash vertical. Um, quite a natural fit. Uh, I can think a few more record to report could be another good candidate. Um, we use a lot of NLP, uh, I mean to say natural language programming and then predictive analytics to drive uh, future investment decisions or cost control measures. Uh, it's a long answer, uh, but I hope it, it, it actually helps you to understand what it takes to establish a data analytics function. Uh, great, and I see we're getting a couple of uh, questions coming in, some, some of uh, some of which we'll, uh, you know, be able to come to uh, as we move on. Right. So, 
you mentioned offer to cash there and, and record to report cost management as natural starting places. And, and, and I see that especially for substantially sized organizations um, that that could be. And there's also examples around credit worthiness that could be applied to customers. And that means the organization can make smarter decisions that are more agile, but without increasing risk. I mean, basically anywhere you want to identify root causes from trends in transactions that you can't see with the naked eye, so to speak, or, or using a bit of Excel wizardry. And from that, you'll you find either value leakage or process inefficiency, or maybe control or compliance issues to be fixed. So there's plenty of food for thought there. Well, now let's move on from process and get into the nitty gritty of, of, nitty -gritty of data. So many organizations do struggle with data quality and, and even integrity. I mean, it's an issue I find with almost any client with whom I've worked. So I could see that dirty or inconsistent data quality could actually jeopardize your attempts to apply data science. So what are your recommendations on how an organization should approach it if they've got data quality concerns or maybe they've not even yet implemented data quality standards? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so to apply data science, uh, we need data for sure, uh, right? And then the logic is quite simple. Cleaner and more accurate data will produce uh, better and more predictable results. Um, but does it mean that we can't do anything if the data is scattered all over uh, or the quality is not great? No, that's not the case. Um, we can still start small, um, something small. And, and then, as I said earlier, uh, we can take smaller data sets, uh, build focus models, smaller focus models, uh, solve minor problems, and, and then eventually eat the big fish later. Uh, of course, bigger leaps need better data quality, but as I said, um, it is not a constraint taking smaller baby steps. Uh, and, and moreover, I feel the business understanding stage is more critical than the structured or the unstructured data. And, and this is the stage which actually helps in defining the customer goal. Uh, and in this stage, um, a data scientist really has to ask the customer many questions about every aspect of the problem to clarify uh, the organizational requirements and, and these are the organizational requirements then further define the data we need and, and how should we collect it um, and these days text or numbers is, is not only the data we know when I mean, we have gone beyond those days um, even a motion or a picture is also data and, and data science can actually analyze and in such unstructured data so i hope that answers your data quality part yeah that's really interesting to share because I'd always assumed that data quality or, or lack of it, that would be a real showstopper. But what I'm hearing you say is be tactical and work with what you've got if you believe that there's some value there to be unlocked. So I'm sure that's going to create some appetite for our webinar participants today. So we've talked about process and data and uh, now let's move to a topic I'm passionate about, which is organization design. So as well as thinking about the overall organizational structures, I like to think a lot about the skills and the behaviors required when I'm working on role and ultimately job design. Let's be honest, these days we're talking about both human and machine based roles, especially in some of the more heavily transactional processes within finance. But Thinking about the human roles, um, when it comes to data, I would probably group the skills into three buckets. One, data intuition, two, data transformation, and three, data communication or storytelling. So let's start with data intuition. And by that, I mean being able to interpret and use analytics to support decision making. So what are, what are your thoughts there? What skills should finance leaders look for when they're hiring or developing staff? Uh, OK, so uh, Jennifer, data scientists are those professionals or those people who turn uh, data into information. Um, so, so definitely statistical know-how is at the forefront of the toolkit. Um, knowing your algorithms and, and how and when to apply them is arguably uh, the central task of, uh, of a data scientist work. Um, the second attribute which I can think of uh, 
for the data scientist is technical acumen. Um, I feel that having a natural interest in coding and, and, and understanding the logic of coding structure um, is quite important, is a must actually. And then last but not the least uh, is telling a story from analysis. Uh, algorithmic output has to be interpreted and communicated to the decision makers. Uh, in short, a data scientist should a techno should be sort of a techno functional um, and then we also call as a purple people. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's all I can think of from the attributes of a data scientist. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Sharon. You know, you've mentioned this um, concept of purple people before, and uh, it was a new one to me. I looked it up. In case anyone in the session hasn't heard of it before, purple yeah. people in a business context, that means people who have the knowledge and insight to leverage new and emerging technologies and undertake analytics of data to solve organizational problems through traditional business skills. And I really like that definition, which combines collaboration with analytics. And I see that one of the, the questions that we had is around whether the data scientists should sit within the finance function or sit within the IT function and work together with IT. And I think that, you know, that that in my opinion, that very much depends on, on, on the company and, and the various profiles that finance and IT have. But what I would say is going forward, I see more and more that data scientist skill sets will be looked for as part of a finance professional. Uh, not all finance professionals ne necessarily, but some of them. And I think as the things that, that we touch on here, and maybe as we come to in the next two things we're going to look at, it will explain that a bit. So I, I would anticipate more and more um, hiring of data scientists going forward. But the thing is, you know, for finance leaders, maybe like me, who, who've grown up and learned our trade in a time before data science was, was part of it all, it's, it can be challenging to recruit data scientists. I mean, it's, it's just difficult to identify talent and expertise when it's outside your own core area. But I guess the reality is that before you get to the stage where you bring those kind of skills in house or in team, if you're thinking from finance to, or from IT to finance, a finance leader would probably already be working with someone like yourself at an earlier stage, whether that's opportunity identification or maybe the subsequent deployment. So they would have your knowledge to draw on and, and you've, you've led data scientists before. So you're an experienced team leader there. All right, so next let's talk about the data transformation. And for me, uh, that includes everything around collecting and then using the data in the models, whatever the mathematical basis might be, uh, and so ready for the next step. So Tushar, what, what do you look for here? Oh, okay, <laughs> so, so that's my favorite topic, uh, data transformation. and. It is actually the foundation of data science and not only in finance, but in uh, every domain, Jennifer, because um, every time we may not get a desired format of data structure uh, or, 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 uh, or a data which is needed for the right analysis. But but let's understand um, what is data transformation, first of all, right? Um, it's all about changing format, data type, its structure uh, or values of data, cleaning the data, removing null values um, or rather treating none values, removing duplicate values. Um, and uh, maybe at times removing the uh, irrelevant, irrelevant columns. Um, so uh, now the tools and techniques used for the data transformation purely depends on the format, complexity, structure, uh, volume. Uh, now what specific we do during the data transformation uh, is, is based on the organizational problem and, and what analysis to be performed. Uh, let me give an example even. Uh, if I'm doing an aggregated analysis, um, I will use a raw data and then transform it to show simple statistics like minimum, maximum, sum and count. Um, but if I'm doing attribute construction or a feature construction of a, uh, of a data tra of tra data transformation, then obviously the new attributes are constructed and added uh, from the given set of attributes uh, and then that helps data mining. Now there are many other techniques if I start talking about for the data transformation, but the point here is to re-emphasize that any method is actually based on analysis needed and a problem to be solved for the organization. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, I guess that just emphasizes the last point I made that finance leaders shouldn't start, start with recruitment, but you must first understand the problem and the consequent analytical skill set that you need. And your recruitment can really only come at a later stage in deployment. 
absolutely correct, Jennifer, right? And most of the organization should make an experiment or a proof of concept before making uh, any sort of heavy investment. Mm, yeah. OK, so so the lastly, the third one was data communication. Um, and I have a saying that data needs to become information to generate insights. And finally, you can make the intervention. So information, insights and intervention. And I know that whether we're talking about the use of statistics in Lean Six Sigma or any of the econometric or quantitative met methods that you've mentioned earlier on, storytelling is such a fundamental component of being a high performing finance business partner. Maybe you can share something from your own experience on that one. Yeah, so uh, Jennifer, I, I, I think I spoke about this briefly earlier. Um, a data scientist or a Lean Six Sigma black belt, I mean, whatever the role be, um, we are playing with data um, and we understand numbers. Um, we use mathematical and statistical tools to arrive at some patterns or, or solve riddles when the answers are hidden in the large and complex data volumes. However, most of the time uh, process owners or the senior stakeholders uh, who ultimately decide for the organization are not the statistical or machine learning model experts. Uh, they're just looking for simple solutions in a very simple language. Uh, mm -hmm. And as data scientists, we need, really need to provide them with insights and recommendations uh, in the storyline related to their organizational environment. Um, that is often why great machine learning model fails to get deployed. Um, whether finance or any other transformation journey, I feel a data scientist must translate the numbers into solution and, and, and then communicate effectively with the decision makers. I mean, that's what I, I have. Yeah, I mean, that's what my view is. Yeah, makes so much sense to me, Tushar. I mean, regarding senior stakeholders that I've worked with, and uh, with all due respect, you're correct. They're not necessarily statistical experts. Yeah, and I've that's... often been coaching um, quite senior finance folks on how to ask the right questions at a, for example, the make project toll gate, especially the analyze toll gate meeting, where a black belt would be putting forward the statistical tools that they'd use to understand the variation in the process. And the decision executives often hadn't touched any statistics since they were at university. So they needed to brush up a little bit to be effective in their role. And data science, that's really next level. I mean, it's likely not something you've covered at university unless you've got a specific background, maybe with some mathematics in it. So again, I really suggest bringing in expert advice uh, when it's needed. So lastly, uh, I'd like to talk about risk and control. So we've talked process, we've talked data, we've talked organization. Now let's talk risk and controls. And the big thing in this space is moving from preventative and detective controls to predictive controls and risk analytics. And this area, I think, really lends itself well to the use of data science. And you've already cited uh, some use cases, uh, for example, in the finance services sector because they've been relatively early adopters for this. But actually, the application is much broader than for, for that. And for both financial and non-financial controls, really in all industries. So again here, I would imagine that a standard control framework with a good risk and control cycle where there's decent procedures for testing the design and operating effectiveness of the controls. Um, that's kind of your starting point. What do you think about that one? Hmm. Yeah, so I was expecting I was expecting this. I mean, how can we talk about data science application in finance and then we forget about uh, risk management? Yeah. Um, so uh, see, Jennifer, uh, data science can be used to mine past patterns, we know, and, and, and then it uh, and it comes to specific production predictions for the future. Um, now, these are the predictions backed up by strong evidences and, and then deep analytical findings uh, then can be used to evaluate the risk for the for the businesses. Um, some of the real life use cases are in identification of exposure of loss, 
you know um, I, I mean to say the record of, uh, of repeated risk can be of a great uh, significance to the organization now with the help of this data uh, they can have a clear picture of repetitiveness and severity of the risk involved. Uh, data science can also be implemented to understand the past occurrence of the incidents, its consequences to the organization and the extent to which uh, uh, other organizations are also been affected. Um, now, particularly this comprises uh, a deep study to know what the risk has to bring for, uh, for, for a specific organization. And the most significant aspects of, um, of data science and risk management, I feel, is, is all about studying and preparing for future risks, um, considering past happenings and understanding the current scenario. So everything into totality. Now this approach to risk management results in more detailed and comprehensive uh, decision making for the organization. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, data science really plays a very critical role in risk management. Mm. Great, well, we've talked a bit there on some of the foundations to get started with data science. And now I'd like to think about the um, deployment approach. Um, and, you know, we, one of the questions we got earlier was about size of organizations. Doesn't this just work in in large multinationals? So let's let's think about that as, as we go through this. So as I said in the introduction, you and I, we first got to know each other when we were like working on large scale global continuous improvement deployment, including the upskilling of the organization in Lean Six Sigma, as well as the delivery of, of both bigger, but also a lot of smaller projects. And um, one of the things that made that program so successful, for me at least, was the focus on mindset and behaviors. And I think it might even have been in connection with that, that we both gained our change management qualifications. Also, Hans is moderating today, uh, is in the same boat. And, and at least for me, those 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 change management techniques are some things that I use on virtually every project or program that I've been involved with subsequently. And I find it such a game changer in terms of cost and speed and the sustainability of whatever change it is that I'm introducing. And in your remarks so far, you've you've mentioned change management several times. And what I'm hearing is there are many things in common with a continuous improvement or a process deployment, at least the way we go about it at Lockridge Transformations. And I know that you and I, Char, we both share those values. Um, as it happens in the February webinar, I talked quite a bit about leadership behaviours needed to develop the mindset in the organisation. And if that's something that people are curious about, I would recommend uh, having a look at that recording uh, and checking that out. Um, otherwise, questions we can we can take further when we get to the Q&A uh, later on. Sure, sure, Jennifer. All right, so. Um, well, Tushar, thanks for sharing the insights today. Um, it's a really a fascinating subject and we could talk for longer about it for sure, but I really want to get into Q&A uh, and give everybody a chance to pose questions. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, if you're not sure, you open the Q&A function by clicking the icon to the right of the leave button. I think quite a few people have grasped that already looking uh, at what's coming in. Um, but you also see on the screen right now, there's a QR code and that uh, takes you to our feedback survey. So grab your phone, scan that, and take a couple of minutes to, to fill in the feedback. It only takes, as I say, a couple of minutes, but it really helps us quite a lot. All right, so you'll see me glancing to the left because I have a, a separate screen with some of the, the questions on it. So um, let us start with, let's have a look. Right, so I see here, let me publish this one. There's a question about deep learning. Um, so question for you to share, how, how to apply deep learning, which you mentioned earlier on, how do you apply that in finance processes and activities? And have you got any examples that you might have had from your own life? Okay. Wow, so I never expected that I would get a question on deep learning. But anyway, OK, so this concept is quite uh, advanced and technical, but then uh, let me try to make it simple and, and that um, all of us understand and, and, and you get a clear answer. Uh, let me first talk about uh, 
what is deep learning as a concept? Um, uh, deep learning is a part of artificial intelligence that delivers uh, an output for even extremely uh, complex inputs. Now, I don't want to assume that our audience already knows about what artificial intelligence is. So let me just take a minute on what is artificial intelligence. It's nothing but and then let me just call this AI. Uh, so AI is a broad concept that means all the concepts learned by machines were originally uh, human actions. Uh, making it more straightforward, let's say um, AI is, is is any such machine that shows the traits of human mind, um, such as rationalizing, learning um, and problem solving. Uh, now then comes the co concept of uh, machine learning, uh, which actually involves the study of algorithms and statistical models. Based on this study, the machines uh, or systems perform a task and then and, and, and do uh, they, they really do not need any explicit instructions. Instead, the machines rely on learned patterns and then past uh, inferences. Now, lastly, uh, and then a little more deeper concept is, is deep learning, as the name suggests. Deep learning utilizes uh, a vast amount of data uh, or the complexities of the information available. Now, with that information, the deep learning model can identify the errors and then correct them independently without human intervention. And let me just reiterate without human intervention. So that's the fun part here. Um, so the question uh, again, coming back to the question that how deep learning helps in finance tra transformation. Um, so let me just answer these by this by by, by using an example. Um, a real life example is loan approval evaluation, uh, where the deep learning neural networks in deep learn uh, in deep learning really help the bank uh, decide whether whether or not to approve a loan application based on learning patterns for both approving and rejecting of of the applications. Um, I myself have worked on a project using deep learning model for oil price prediction, um, mm -hmm. and the models I designed has 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 actually. Very high accuracy, I must say. Um, I used a combination of time series models, uh, stochastic models, um, and regression model. Well, I really don't want to get into details of that, but then uh, that's how you can do use deep learning. Um, and then you know, oil prices are really volatile. I mean, they keep on changing every day, and if investors can predict predict them, they can really make the right decisions to make any profitable uh, investment decisions. So this is one way of deep learning uh, which can create value for stakeholders. Um, there could be many other ways, but I hope that gives a flavor of how deep learning can be applied or implemented in uh, finance. Great to share, and I think we must have a few folk on the line with a bit of expertise in data science because the next yeah, question is about right. <laughs> the next question I've picked out is about programming language and uh, which programming language to choose for finance. Is it Python or R and, and why? Now, I'm wondering if you're going to say, well, you've got to first understand the problem before you choose the tool. But let me not put words in your mouth to share. What, what's what's your answer on the programming language? Um, if I have to answer my preference that way, uh, it is always Python. Python is much more flexible. Uh, it's an open IDE. Uh, mm -hmm. as compared to R. Well, nothing wrong in using R as well, uh, but Python is the preferred one. Yeah. yeah, and that's just you have a general preference for that. Is there something specific about finance that you would make a choice? Uh, I think I will say it's a general preference because mm -hmm. uh, uh, Python community, support communities, uh, flexibility. I think there are many other USPs which are related to Python. I'm not saying uh, do not use R. I mean, there are people who are learning R. Um, it's equally helpful. I think there are just a bit of little more merits related to Python as compared to R. So I think, yeah, my personal preference is always Python. OK, thanks, Tushar. Right, uh, what shall we take next? OK, here's a question about the difference between data warehouses and data lakes. Maybe you can say something on that one. Oh, OK, yeah, I mean, <laughs> So uh, and I don't know from where this question is coming from, but then yeah, still uh, relevant to data science because yeah, it, it del deals with a huge amount of data and organization often use data lakes and then data warehouses. But yeah, let me answer this. So uh, a data lake uh, differs from a data warehouse in many ways. Um, while hierarchical data warehouse stores data in in, in files or folders, um, a data lake uses a flat architecture or uh, to store data and, and, and but the difference is much more in the it's, it's just not that. 
Um, data warehouses store large quantities of structured data in, in a very well organized manner. Um, and then businesses can extract, alter, or improve information, and data can be used uh, as and when needed. So, 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 therefore, the data quality in data warehouses is much higher and then more reliable than what's stored in the data lake. A data lake differs from data warehouses mainly because of the different types of formats they can house, uh, mm -hmm. and because the data does not have to be formatted first. Uh, as a result, data lakes have relatively uh, lesser cost, so they are cost efficient uh, because of the nature of the data and, and because this is inexpensive format. Um, in addition, businesses can manage this to house the data lakes for longer for future use, uh, and then the data can be extracted at any time. Now, depending on the purpose, but obviously the effort uh, to convert into the structured data is more in data lake. I think that's what I can think of. Uh, I mean, if, if I have to get into details, then the answer could be more longer, but I hope this answers the query. Yeah, and of course we can only answer questions kind of briefly now. People are always free to get in touch with us afterwards for more detail or follow up. Sure, so sure. next question I'm going to pick is a follow up to something you said um, about natural language programming. And I think you were talking about um, cost management or investments, that kind of thing. So the question is how how to use natural language programming in, in that arena? Uh, in my experience, I have used natural language programming in record to report. So what happens um, or in the traditional world, uh, we used to do a lot of reporting, right? Mm -hmm. So we get the raw data from different systems or ERP systems. Um, we will process that data. Uh, we'll dump that into Excel. Uh, we'll do a lot of analysis through pivots. Uh, and formatting and, and then we convert that into hefty PPTs and then we send it out as packs. Right? So yeah. that was the traditional cycle. Uh, now one common thing is uh, or one unique thing is that these packs are generally used for decision making. Uh, now when you say that leaders are using these packs and this information for decision making, which means the analysis which is done by an analytics person uh, or a financial analyst, what we see uh, used to say in a traditional term, yeah. has to understand the data and has to convert that into information. And using his own intelligence, he has to write a lot of uh, commentaries. Uh, yeah. The word I hope you remember from your good old days. Oh, start, started my finance life writing those commentaries. Yeah, like many yeah, people. I, eh? <laughs> I have used NLP in building those commentaries, right? I mean, uh, there are simple pluses and minus on a monthly report or YTT report. Um, I can use NLP in, in building those commentaries and, and then the financial analyst analyst, uh, analyst has to really spend l much, much lesser time as compared to a standard time or in traditional format. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has given a lot of, lot of saving from the workforce front. Um, right. So that's one application of NLP. There could be many more, but organizations are really using NLP in, in, in record to report for automating their commentaries. Yeah, so just getting the management information cycle quicker exactly. and, and as you say, with fewer people. Great. No, that's sure. good to hear. OK. Um, so I think um, with that, it's maybe almost almost time to, to kind of move on a little bit. So. Um, Thank you everybody for the questions uh, that you've you've given us today and for joining us. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly have, and uh, we'd love to stay in touch. And as we said, if we've if not got reached the level of detail that that you wanted with the questions, please do uh, connect with us. Um, so if we're not already connected in LinkedIn, please do send us a connection request. You can also follow Lockridge Transformations on LinkedIn and stay up to date with our blogs other webinars and, and other content that we share. Our next webinar is actually already scheduled. That's for the 7th of April, uh, and that's on finance organizational models that deliver. So if you're interested also in uh, where data science should sit within the organization, maybe that's one, one for you. So Wun Hui, who's one of the other consultants at Lockhart Transformations, uh, she and I together will be sharing our step-by-step -step model to get the most out of organizational transformation. And you can register for that session already at lockridgetransformations.com. Just check out the learn section and look for webinars. So you can also send us an email and we've included the links here to our meeting scheduling tool. If you'd like to set up time with us, 
If there's anything that Tushar or I have said today that's piqued your interest and you'd like to explore further, please just uh, set something up with us. So we've really just scratched the surface on data science for finance today. Um, if you want to investigate more, Tushar and I can perhaps talk with you about how we could work together and bring our expertise to bear. It would be very interesting to do that. We're always happy to chat further about this or about anything else. And our consultants at Lockridge Transformations, they all have extensive experience working across multiple locations of all sizes, giving us the knowledge to add value to any organization, whether that's a startup or a multinational in the public, the private or the third sector. And last but not least, we do have quite an active blog at LockridgeTransformations.com and we've included a few links here to blogs which you might find interesting. So please do keep your eyes open for some follow up emails from us with the recording link and some further information. And if you don't see anything in your inbox, please do remember to check your spam folder. So I wish everybody stays healthy and stays safe. Thank you again for your time and we hope to see you next time for the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks. Everybody.